It's Sabaton Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. You know what Wednesday is in the right. United States? It's hump day. Hump day. Hump day. <laughs> it's a, it's that hump is day. encouraged but not mandatory. Uh, we had uh, we had a commercial. <laughs> we had a commercial over here where the a camel was walking through the office buildings. I don't know if it made it over there, and he was hump day. Geico. Yeah, it was yeah. great, great commercial. So anyway. I actually am in the driver's seat today because, you know, we decided that women shouldn't be allowed to drive. And Oh, uh, hell no, that's not what, what happened? happened. What happened? That didn't What'd happen. What did I say? Yeah, well, that did no, not I, you, know, you guys know I'm just teasing, just <laughs> poking at her and poking at each other. Love you, Mommy. Love you, too. Okay, so tell them what we're doing today, Mom, for uh, Sabaton we're Wednesday. Do the Sabaton History Channel. Um, Attack of the Dead Men. Okay, we have no idea what this is about. Um, and there's a song afterwards, and we're going to do the live version. We haven't seen Sabaton right. live in we a while. We haven't seen live in a while, so we'll do that. All right, you guys ready? Yes. Here we go. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Pat from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. There are a lot of legendary tales that came out of the Great War. Yeah, and uh, the song, Attack of the Dead Men, talks about one of the most legendary. And the strangest. And the most legendary. Mm. Yeah, but the strangest. And maybe most legendary. I like him. Is that for his husband? Is that for his husband? Osovitz Fortress was built in the late 19th century on a strategic hotspot near the river Biebrze in what is now Poland, but back then was the Russian Empire. It was just about 50 kilometers away from East Prussia, though, along the important railway line from Bialystok to Königsberg, which conveniently ran straight through the fortress. So it's kind of obvious why this was quite a headache for German high command in the Great War. This close to the German border and effectively controlling one of the few railway lines through all the bogs and marshes in the area, the fortress had to either be taken or destroyed. Otherwise, it would prevent any advance into northern Poland. In fact, the Germans had tried to take the fortress back in September 1914, and again in February 1915, where the second attack had severely damaged much of the fortress defenses through heavy bombing. But the main defensive ring had nonetheless held long enough for the Russian counterattacks to force the attackers to break off. By the summer of 1915, though, the Kaiser's army was determined to try again. Now, August von Mackensen's Gorlitz Tarnov offensive that summer had thrown much of the Russian forces on the Eastern Front off balance, and German and Austro-Hungarian forces advanced on a wide front eastwards. Seeing their chance, German high command wanted to also take Poland in a frontal attack and ordered General Feldmarshal Paul von Hindenburg on the offensive. Osowitz Fortress was an important prize to take from the weakened Russian army. So 12 German infantry battalions, accompanied by up to 30 heavy artillery pieces, set their sights on Osowitz. The core of the Russian defenders under General Lieutenant Berzhozhovsky's command was made up of around 500 men from the 226th Infantry Regiment Zemlyansky, supported by several hundred militia. They dug in in several lines of defenses and redoubts, trying to give the German artillery as small a target as possible. But once the assault began, much of the fortress walls, barracks and towers began to crack under the heavy German siege artillery. But artillery alone won't take the fortress. They would still need the infantry for that job, and the Russians had enough machine guns and defensive works to make that very difficult and very costly. The Germans, though, brought in a fairly new and extremely dangerous weapon, gas. Now, now, gas warfare was fairly new. In 1914, the French had used tear gas, and in early 1915, the Germans had first used poison gas at Bolimov, though that failed. Since then, however, it had had a devastating effect on the totally unprepared and ill-equipped Russian soldiers, who died gruesome and horrible deaths in the deadly clouds of gas. Without gas masks to protect themselves, the defenders of Osovitz were expected to suffer the same fate. In the early morning of August 6th, 
As the winds were finally favorable, the German gas batteries opened up. A dark green smog descended upon the battered defensive works. The wave of gas crept over the Russian lines, creating a death zone. The gas used was made out of a mixture of chlorine and bromine. While the bromine acted as a respiratory irritant, the chlorine attacked the lungs, chemically burning them, right? The chlorine attached itself to moisture in the air, turning it to hydrochloric acid, which then bit into the membranes and flesh of the lungs, aggressively dissolving the soft tissue. The Russian soldiers were literally choking on their own blood, as every breath they took destroyed their lungs. Unable to breathe, they died in agony, coughing out bloody lumps of their own lungs. But it was not only the lungs that suffered, as the acid attacked the soft tissues of the eyes and noses, burning them chemically as well. The soldiers burned from the inside out. Many died within the first few minutes. Sharpen your broadheads and zero your scopes. The first light opener sale is going. Those Sorry. further away from the initial attack tried binding wet rags and urine-soaked shirts around their faces in a desperate attempt to protect themselves, but that often helped little. Everything the wave of gas came in contact with began to die. Leaves and grass turned yellow and black. It killed the insects and the animals in the woods. There was no escaping as the gas crept into every ditch and into every hole, even attaching itself to the brass of guns and shells. The defenders suffered heavy losses and whole companies in the foremost trenches were, were simply wiped out. Only around a hundred men in the defensive lines further back survived, still terribly burned. As the gas dissipated, the German infantry battalions formed up. While other units went to secure the railway line, it was up to the 7,000 men of the German 76th Landwehr Division to storm the main defensive lines in front of the fortress. Confident that most of the defenders had been wiped out and that the few left would be overcome with ease, the German infantry moved onwards. The first lines were indeed littered with only the dead, grotesquely deformed in their final moments of inevitable death. The end. Or was it? As the German troops moved onward over the shelled out ground, they suddenly came under heavy fire. The fortress artillery opened up on them and machine gun fire tore holes in their ranks. Further out on the flanks, the last Russian reserve companies coming up from the rear formed to counterattack the German infantry. Seeing those friendly reinforcements rush in with their bayonets attached, the 100 odd survivors in the trenches also emerged. Bayonets fixed, they stumbled like zombies out of their dugouts, crawling and limping their way into the open. Complete shock stopped the German attackers dead in their tracks. Mm. Like dead men returning to life, the Russian survivors came on, heavily breathing, gasping for air through destroyed lungs, their faces scarred by chemical burns, half hidden with bloody rags. They marched on, thirsting for revenge for the terrible fate thrust upon them. Their tears were bloody, their eyes burned red, they spat blood and parts of their lungs as they advanced, croaking and coughing like the living dead. This horrible sight, as well as the unexpected counterattack, halted the Germans and a deep panic set in. They, they hastily withdrew, soon running away in terror as the panic spread through their ranks, pushing their comrades aside, trampling over each other, stumbling over barbed wire as Russian artillery shells fell in between them. The attack of the dead men came on, accompanied by a bayonet charge of the reserves and recaptured the lost trenches. By 11 a.m., a few hours after the deadly gas attack, the defensive lines were back in Russian control. The Germans had withdrawn back to their own starting positions. Okay, much of the battle remains shrouded in, in legends and mystery, and that is likely to remain so. The casualty numbers on either side are unknown, as are the German records of this battle, though it was certainly a well-deserved tactical victory 
of a small Russian force over a much larger German force. Strategically, it did little to preserve the Russian hold on Poland, and Osovitz's fortress had to be given up weeks later as it was too damaged and the whole front had to pull back anyhow. And since, after the Russian revolutions of 1917, this war was viewed by the Soviet Union as a capitalist war and a source of shame. It was largely edited or written out in their history books. Nowadays, post-Soviet Union, however, the legend of the attack of the dead men is gaining more attention as Russia's interest in the Great War increases. And the legend is certainly a tale worth telling. That is beyond dispute. The whole song Attack of the Dead Man, it was one of those like super like, okay, we're gonna do an album about World War One. Yeah. And um, when I was presenting the idea to to our record label New Club last, they were like, okay, so you're gonna have a song about gas? And I was like, yeah, sure, for there, there will be a, song, a such song. We didn't know exactly how we're gonna cover it, like in, in which area, but the the story of the dead man was one of the absolutely like most legendary ones that we definitely felt that we needed to get in. And then that's the Osovic fortress, that's where we get in the... Have you been yes. there? Uh, no, i never been there. Um, but uh, we, we have received a lot of fan mails saying like, this is something you really should write a song about. So in the end we did. And uh, we had a little bit of a special way of revealing the song to the fans. Because uh, in, uh, in Russia there's this guy who, who is famous <coughs> as uh, Radio Tapok. He's, he's got a very popular YouTube channel. He's a touring heavy metal musician who does cover songs of uh, bands like Sabaton, but he translates them into Russian. Okay. So I asked him, uh, would you be willing to do a song which nobody has ever heard and do it, you translate it into Russian yeah. and you release it before us? And he was wow. like, that's a weird thing. It's I cool never though. heard about it. Sounds kind of cool though. Yeah, so he, he, before anybody has heard the song, yeah. he heard it, he recorded it, he translated it into Russian and he made a music video for it and put it out. Wow. Uh, I, I think that was an um, interesting way. A lot of people said, I'm crazy when I come with such a marketing idea. I mean, you could have sued him for millions of dollars. Uh, uh, yeah, that could Sorry. have been... Um, that could have been the case. Like, hey, you stole our song. <laughs> you told uh, me. Why would I tell you? To? <laughs> <laughs> but we, we actually gave him the song. And it was very popular and he yeah. did a good job. And maybe we can listen to a little bit of Russian version of it. I hope so. Now, since people were asking you to write lots of stuff about the First World War... And I'm not going to pause it again, but that was fantastic. I wanted to, I don't even know what they were saying, but I want to see that video. In Russian? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, just the... It's powerful. Yeah. You've got, you know, about the Red Baron, and Lawrence of Arabia. Which one, they, which one was the topic that most people asked you to write a song about? About World War One. Yeah. yeah. And the most requests are for the Christmas truce. Aha, okay. Funny enough. But we didn't have a song that fitted to it, so uh, we couldn't get it in. But second most wanted song was Attack of the Dead Men. You know, it's interesting because it's only... I didn't know that story before I started writing The Great War. And But I'm a historian, and you think. But it's really the last few years that's become so much more. People know so much more about it. So, you know. uh, and guess where I found out about it? Worry about theft of your mail and packages? Wouldn't it be great if you can manage? Mainly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, from you. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's my job. Uh, well, we have the fans as well. But where, where we were looking for information about it was mainly yeah. from you. Huh. Well, it's nice that I can change the world one person at a time. Or one metal band at a time. <laughs> now, I mentioned before uh, in, the, in the history bit that there's not a lot of specific history about this specific battle. Like, there's so many things mm -hmm. we don't know. Because uh, so many of the records were destroyed or mislaid or intentionally destroyed during the Soviet Union because World War I was not a patriotic <coughs> war, it was a, the imperialist war. It, so, it's yeah. the problem that we often uh, face, you know. Yeah. People say, oh, here is a story. Yeah. 
and then you can't find the proper information about it. These days, it's so much easier. But you, I mean, going back to the beginning when we started to write about it, it was not easy for us to find yeah, information. Yeah, sure. I mean, people who who are into history, people who are historians, they know where to search, where to find. They have the networks to find it. We we stand in the beginning absolutely alone. We didn't even have the fans. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm thankful for where we stand now, where we have good contacts like you, for example, well, very well, good like, reference for World like, War One. Like historians like Marcus and Vika and stuff. That per say hi, people. guys. There you go. <laughs> there are awesome team who, yeah. who who can help us with coming up with the information. But in, in the beginning, it was really difficult. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned the Christmas truce, and people asked a lot during the Great War, and they still ask, they're like, well, did they try anything like that on the Eastern Front? Because the Christmas truce was on the Western Front. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, how come there was nothing like that on the Eastern Front? You know, there's a very simple reason why there wasn't on the Eastern Front. Orthodox. The, that's that's the truth. Um, the, uh, the Some Russian soldiers did try an Easter <laughs> truce in 1916. They came out of their trenches on <laughs> Easter, you know, to start the same sort of thing. And they were all shot at and uh, taken prisoner by the Germans and the Austrians because they used a different calendar, yeah. and it was not—it was 13 days different, so it was not Easter to the Germans and Austrians. They just saw a bunch of Russians walking out of their trenches for hanging out, going, "Hey, come on, here's some drinks," and shot at them. I wouldn't have shot at them. Drinks are drinks. Yeah. Never look a free drink in the. Well, that doesn't make sense. I'll shut up. Now. You can edit that out. Um, so what are you doing? I'm, oh yeah. I'm having ah drinks. Drinks. All right. Well, since it's drinking time, I guess it's time for us to say goodbye, Pear. Yeah, it is. And thank you for everybody for watching this episode of Sabaton History. Listen to me, everybody. We love the Sabaton History channel. If you do it, please share it with us. Support it on Patreon, YouTube, and any way you want. Thank you for your support. Let's do this forever. Okay, um, let's do this forever, right? Now we're going to watch the video. This is lot, the, the Great Tour Live. In and, London. In London, Attack of the Deadman. Yes. Okay. And away we go. Yes, the ultimate weapon of cruelty. A highly effective delivery system of a slow and painful death. This time, a fortress and its few defenders would suffer its horrible consequences. Out of the poisonous cloud came an army of men who should already have been dead. Oh
um, let me get this out of here real quick and then we can discuss, all right? Do you think that we should call Flora's husband Mr. Janssen? You think? Maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> he must feel like that sometimes. He must. He must. And I, I don't know the history of bands. You know, I don't know who came first. You could probably know more than that than I do. No, I know. I was really happy to see Tommy Johansson. Oh, man. Because we had reacted to him on his own and heard he was in Sabaton but didn't know when he joined the band. So what did we watch last week? Stormtroopers. Yeah. And he was just shredding it. Man, he, yeah. he's such and a player. And this time we got to see him too. I he's so you, cute. I'm so glad that, that, you know, we love doing the channel. We love being silly. We love uh, the dogs and our family, but I love Sabaton Wednesday because of the history and the way that they present. And it's, I was thinking when I was watching this, at the time and effort spent on the props. He's got a tank, he's got um, barbed wire all along the front. I mean, a gas mask, it's just amazing. Um, I watched a, uh, an interview with Alice Cooper years and years and years ago, probably 20 years ago. And what he said was that when he was a little boy, he used to see these horror movies, he'd go to theaters to see the horror movies, and he loved the spectacle of it, right? And so he, he put that in his shows. And so that's what that reminds me of a little bit as a, a Alice Cooper show, where he puts all these props and things in it to make it more than just music. Just music like stands alone. Just like the thing with Rammstein. Yes, 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 that's a good Rammstein. point. Rammstein. Good, good point. We, oh, she's having a, a fit stroke. So uh, I will take care of that in a little bit. Oh, I didn't mean to joke about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I loved it. Um, we hope you did. I've How never did heard you of this. Know, I was going to say, did never you know heard anything of, no. about it? I and wasn't really a war historian uh, so much. I mean, I did more social history, and, and a lot of my focus was actually on Europe and the Middle Ages. A lot of it was that. And that as a, as a history major, when you major in history in the States, you have to take a little bit of everything. And so I knew a little bit about the war and, and the sides and all that, but I didn't know anything about that. That's a great story. I'd love to learn more well, about it. Well, they're calling it a legend because there's not account of it, official account of it as much as they need. Right. But I there believe it must records. have happened. There are some yeah. records, are, and if, if nothing more than a word of mouth kind of thing, a lot of history is built on that. So I'd love to think that that's true. But honey, can you just imagine that burning yourself inside out? Well, I can't imagine, you know, because when you get... And a lot of things I'm going to say, I know people, especially stories, are screaming at the screen. I, I apologize, but, um, um, you know, when you go farther back in time and you don't have as much science, right, and it's more steeped in, um, in mythology, steeped in religious fear, things like that, can you imagine? They thought they had wiped everybody out, and then this counterattack comes, right, and they see these hundred men come up with blood in their eyes and out of their like mouths coughing not up their lungs. Up. not giving up it's still that's the other thing mate isn't it amazing i am not going to give up i know that i'm dying and all my comrades are dying from this gas i'm still going to fight you mm -hmm. uh, that's that is wow yeah it's some uh a determination um an impetus that i don't think i could ever understand and mm -hmm. i'm not I just don't have that strength. Maybe if I needed to, I would. But you know, I think that's the difference. I mean, you know, we're not putting. We're we're obviously in America, and we have a, a lot of. You know, I'm not going to bash on America. I love America, and all of the things that we have. But it has. It will make you soft. We know that, right? And if you look at other places in the world, especially at this time, it was still. You know, it wasn't too far removed from the Middle Ages. You know, oh, was really, at the time of the Great War. I I think so. I mean, yeah. again, I'm probably going to get screamed at, but. That's my opinion. Uh, and nobody's gonna listen, scream at you because you might be wrong. Listen, we uh, one thing we didn't say is if you like this video and the other stuff that we do, or the dogs, or Bonesy back there, if you see Bones back there on the drums, he's not giving up either. He's just Bones is gonna play the, the drums. Um, like, subscribe, share this video with your friends, please. You have my permission, her permission, and uh, hit the no, notification. Hit, hit the notification bell. And so you can see what other crazy stuff we're doing. Right? Anything else? Um, no, I just... Man, I tell you for... Oh, I'm going to say two thumbs up on this. 
Yeah. And two fingers. I'll give it two thumbs up, fingers. absolutely. I will not give it my middle finger because my middle finger is deformed. Yes. On we, my right hand. She decided on a new nickname that we'll release next time. Um, Jank Finger Sue. Um, Jank Finger Sue? Yeah, I think that's what we, we decided. Really? Isn't that what we decided? No. Oh, okay. Um, well, we love you. Yes. And, and, and be blessed. Be blessed. And please, man, after watching something like this, yeah. please don't hurt anybody. Don't hurt anybody. All right, we love be you. Kind. Bye. And also, don't be a jerk. Yeah. It's easy. Just don't be a jerk. Yeah, it doesn't take long. Well, that is easy, but then I could turn around and be a jerk to you in five minutes. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah I, can. I, uh, I do sometimes. Uh, Scott Caldwell's on it.